the wonderful, the awesome, Chris. A uh, quick reminder, we do have a fellowship afterwards, and although Chris won't be directly speaking about fossils, <laughs> if you could lead in at the very end, mm. would something that's only 79 years old be considered a fossil? Mm. No, okay. Fair <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. This is a, this is literally one of my favorite subjects. I think. Uh, I mean, Mike. Many people. I've always been a big animal lover. I mean, in my opinion, a, pe a, a person that doesn't like animals, you know, and, or doesn't like kids, there's just something wrong with the, such people. You know, it, animals are just awesome. One of the favorite parts of creation. I love going out and exploring God's creation, but. Uh, to explore it without seeing animals at some point in time to me is just disappointing. And you know, as a, as a teacher at a Christian school, I, I, to my students, I always try to make, make, the, make it understood to them why science is important for a person of faith. Many of my students often go off in uh, science careers of some sort, but science is important for other reasons, not that it, just that it can, could ultimately lead to a career for these young people, but it's important because, well, through science, we're learning about God's creation and the many wonderful things that he has made. And so by exploring his creation through a scientific study like this, we can develop a better appreciation of, of who our Father is. <clears throat> well, one of the most, uh, I, I, like I say, I've, just, I've always been a big animal lover. This is part of God's creation that we have always just loved the most. We've made pet, pets of so many of these. These are my dogs, all uh, eventually died of old age. That's Willie and Eli and, and uh, Chelsea. All, uh, they moved here with me from, uh, from Oklahoma, but eventually all died of old age. I don't have any dogs now, but hope to at some point have a, have a house again in a, a yard large enough for dogs. But they're without a doubt, I think, the most loved part of, our, of God's creation. They're just a tremendous gift from him. They were a tremendous gift. And for a person that loves their pet, that should be felt by you, that they were a gift. God wanted to make a world for us that was pleasing to us, and that was part of the pleasing, most, that's part of the, what he gave to us, as these animals that we would love so much. And anyone that's had a pet for a long time and lost them knows that the tremendous love, that, that, can, be, uh, that can be there. Well, we, we, at this point, we really don't know how many animals there really even are on the earth. Most of them are off in coral reefs and uh, in uh, Af these rainforest. It is estimated that there may be somewhere between three and 30 million species of animals on the earth, mostly because the, the estimate on the range of insects, uh, of insect populations ranges from one to 30 million. Uh, insects are very, very tiny and, and many times, and we, so we really don't know how many animals there are. The estimates literally range that far. But they are without a doubt the most elegant part of God's creation, the most beautiful part, and the most fascinating part. Just the way they move oftentimes just captivates you. Um, going out on hikes myself, I remember one time I went up and hiked up to Lake 22, uh, and be beautiful scene, right after I moved here, beautiful, one of the most beautiful scenes I had ever seen in my life, this crystal clear lake with a, with a cliff behind it and waterfalls, but at some point I was sitting on a big rock eating my lunch, and a little chipmunk jumped up on that rock, and before I knew it, this tremendous scene of this lake and this cliff and these waterfalls was gone, and all I, all I, all I could think about was this little chipmunk jumping around beside me. Well, we're finding new animal species all the time. This is an, just a couple of examples. This is an unknown mollusk that was recently discovered out the coast of, uh, of California near the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is a, a newly discovered shark species. This one is called the ninja lantern shark because it is pitch black like a ninja. And, uh, but it's called the lantern shark because it has bioluminescent structures. It's, uh, it enabled, is, enables it to camouflage itself well in the dark by being very black. It's uh, camouflaged down in the dark waters. But when it's up in lighter waters, it will emit a faint blue glow from these bioluminescent structures. Many of the animals down in the deep dark make light. The jellyfish, for example, and the, even your squids, and many, many, many animals in the ocean, but in particular the deep dark, emit, uh, emit light. And uh, some of these jellyfish just look like spaceships flashing with all kinds of reds and blues and these kind of things. 
Well, one of my favorite animals of zoology, what we call animal biology, is animal behavior. And I think because within animal behavior, we recognize just how intelligent animals really are. <laughs> animals are really, really intelligent. And anyone that's been around mammals for an extended period of time rec has probably recognized this. But you might, you might have seen even videos of, uh, of squirrels or, or crows even, for example, solving these complex puzzles that people have set up in their backyards to obtain a food source, where they have to click trip one thing and then another thing and another thing have to go through a series of like 10 steps to eventually get to the food source. These animals are crazy smart, but there's a lot of things that they can do that most people don't know about. And to illustrate that, I, I like to uh, point out what are some of the least intelligent animals, I guess you would call that, and that are some of our insects, which don't even really have a brain. They don't have a brain as we understand them. They just have a little cluster of neurons up, up in the head region called a ganglia. But they are engaged in some colony-wide complex behaviors that is described as a hive mentality. Now much, if you ever were a fan of sci-fi, is the Borg. If you remember the Borg from Star Trek, they, were the, they had a hive mentality. They could all communicate telepathically. But some of these, some of these hive insects seem to be able to communicate somehow or another on these. Uh, let me just give you a couple of examples. These are, these, there are some ants that are engaged in horticulture. Horticulture. Now, these are leaf cutter ants. It's hard to see the ants underneath those pieces of leaves, uh, carrying those pieces of leaves, but leaf cutter ants will cut out big chunks of leaves and then haul them off to their dens or whatever we call their underground colonies in the, in the forest floor, carry these leaves off to their den, and understandably, everyone in the beginning assumed that they were eating the leaves. I mean, what I, why, why else would you be cutting leaves and haul them off to your home unless you're eating them? Well, come to find out that they don't eat the leaves. Instead, what they're doing is they, they, do, they haul these leaves off to their den and, then they, and they chew them up, but they don't consume what they chew up. Instead, they feed this pulp to an underground garden that they're growing of fungus. They're growing a garden of fungus. You can see some of it right there. This is an underground photo, a video that's being taken. They not only do they feed this mulch to their fungus, but they prune the fungus. They harvest the fungus. They harvest it into little balls and stack them up. Here in just a second, you can see a pile of uh, these fungal balls that these ants, he's harvesting uh, little, these little fungal balls right there. And you can see the big pile of fungal balls that they've stacked up right there. Well. This uh, reference is, uh, is falling a little bit, uh, 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 falling a little bit far, but, uh, but there was a, a D Disney movie that came out a while back called A Bug's Life. Now, and the queen in A Bug's Life was, uh, the voiceover was done by Phyllis Diller. So you may rem at least not remember Phyllis Diller. But Phil the, the queen had a little uh, a dog, like uh, had, a had a little pet with her that she called Afy. Well, what aphid is, is an aphid. And the reason why the queen has an aphid is because ants care for aphids. They are engaged in animal husbandry. They care for aphids, and they, they care for them underground during the winter. And then they take their herds of aphids out to pasture when the weather is nice. They'll take them out to pasture. If you, I've seen this a number of times. If you ever see ants crawling up in a bush, Stop and take a look and see what they're doing up in that bush. Because Chan, nine times out of ten, what they're doing up in that bush is, is, they're, is they're, they're, they have their herd of aphids up in that bush. The aphids will drill into plants with their mouth part called a proboscis and suck out the juices. And then they make a honeydew that they exude and the ants will eat this honeydew. Engaged in animal husbandry. But again, they care for them even over the winter and then bring them back out to pasture when, uh, when springs return. There are also ants that make complex uh, above ground nests called the leaf weaver ants. And they do this in areas where there's uh, rain, rainfall tends to flood out their underground tunnels, so they've taken to making a nest above ground. But this, this is a complex construction project they're, that they're engaged in. And the question is, where's the foreman? Everyone seems to know exactly what to do at any given point in time. There are some ants that will be the holders, that they will grasp the leaves and hold them into place. Others will come and serve as the gluers. They will bring their larvae up. You can see one of them with a, one of their larvae. They bring their larvae up that secrete a silken strand, and they use their larvae to sew these leaves together. But the big mystery is, where's the foreman? How do they know what to do? It's a cooperative, colony-wide effort that they're engaged in, a construction project, where everyone has a different job, and yet, where's, where's the, who's, who's telling them what to do? They seem to be commu they're communicating, but the, the, one of the big mysteries in this point in the animal kingdom is communication. 
They're clearly communicating because they all know what to do and they seem to know exactly when to, what, when to do it. We've recognized that there are several forms of animal communication, that there, there are clearly weird gestures and postures. There's visual forms of communication that they're clearly using. There are vocal forms of communication that they're using. Animals will, will yell out specific calls when uh, threats are present. You think of the vocalizations of some of your aquatic mammals like your whales and these kind of things. A complex vocalizations are seen amongst birds, and, and again, for example. But the only commu animal communication, and there, there's other forms, there's uh, ants are very, some insects are very touchy-feely. They have these little antenna-like parts called pedipalps, and they're always touching each other with these pedipalps, which seems to be communication in nature. And some have chemical signals called pheromones that they secrete. But w it's all a big mystery to us at this point. The only, f uh, the only cam animal communication that at this point we've been able to in translate is a interesting little dance that's performed by honeybees that looks like this. Now, when this was first witnessed, it was believed that what the, this was was a mating dance. Birds engage in complex mating dances. Males will do dance-offs, and field hens will do dance-offs in the middle of a clearing. Birds of Paradise, if you've never seen the dances that Birds of Paradise do, I mean, it's just a beautiful, very bizarre, exotic dances Birds of Paradise do. It's amazing. But when this was seen, it was assumed this was a mating dance until it was originally realized that what these were were scout bees that had just returned to the hive and were communicating to the hive the source of the food that they had found. The information portion of the dance is communicated during the straight, it's a figure eight dance that they do, and the communication portion is communicated in the straight run, where the dancer vigorously vib vibrates or waggles their abdomen, thus it's called the waggle dance, and emits strong vibrations during this waggle. In addition, there's audible buzzes that have been, uh, that have been, uh, that are, are seen. Well, the angle of the run in relation to the, to the uh, comb is, is, describes the direction of the flower patch that's been found in relation to the sun. So the angle is the angle that the food source is to the sun. The distance from the hive is communicated precisely by the duration of the waggle, which equate, equates one second of waggle to one kilometer of distance. So it's communicating not just the direction of the food source, but the exact distance of the food source is being communicated. And the intensity of the vibrations or the audible homes is communicating quality. The quality of the some communication about the quality of the food source being is being uh, transmitted there as well, but that this is the only com communication that we've translated tells us how little we really understand animals, because of insects, co colony insects like this are communicating specific information to the hive. What must the mammals be communicating? The higher animals, some of those complex calls we hear uh, whales, for example, giving, and these kind of things are very very, very specific and unique for species. Some dolphins have calls unique to their individuals. So we, we, ha we know that there's communication going on, but that's one of the big mysteries. And uh, I can't wait till we uncover more about what animals are actually doing there. Well, recently, researchers at the University of Cambridge uh, discovered a remarkable design feature found in these tiny little insects called leafhoppers. And this was just discovered and reported in the journal Science in 2013. Now, this little insect jumps as its primary mode of movement, kind of like a flea does, but does so over incredible distances and speeds. It jumps, its jumps are estimated to be something close to five meters per second and reaching 500, 700 G-forces as it accelerates. So as such, a mechanism to carefully control the timing of its legs is necessary or else it would enter what's called a yaw rotation and just spin out of control. And so to accomplish this precision jumps, scientists Scientists have discovered that these tiny insects have, are, have hind leg joints with gears. There's curved cog-like strips of opposing teeth that intermesh and rotate just like the mechanical gears that we make. Now the lead researcher, a guy by the name of Malcolm Burroughs, stated this about its design feature. He says, the gears in the hind leg bear remarkable, in, a remarkable engineering resemblance to those found on every bicycle and inside every car gearbox. Each gear tooth has a rounded corner at the point it connects to the gear strip, a feature identical to man-made gears such as bicycle gears. Essentially, it's a shock absorbing mechanism to stop teeth from shearing off. The gear teeth on the opposing hind leg locks together like those in a car gearbox, ensuring almost complete synchronicity in leg movement. 
It's amazing uh, designs that are found in uh, the animals that God has made. But of course, this extraordinary illustration of design in God's creation is dismissed as an evolutionary artifact. Malcolm Burrell states this, these gears are not designed. They're evolved. Represents high speed and precision machinery evolved for synchronization in the animal world. Now in this, in this article, he talks over and over about design features and uses the word design in the article, in engineering in the article. But then he go, turns around and says this. But I, and I think there's a couple of reasons perhaps for saying it. And the most obvious may be that if you don't say it, you're not going to get published. When you start pointing out design features in nature, you better make it sure, make it very clear that uh, you are not talking about real design features and like intelligent design features, that you're talking about something that came about through pretty natural processes. You're not going to get published, you know, but it is sad that, that they don't see it that it, it, maybe he just doesn't see it. Maybe he doesn't acknowledge it to himself, but where there's design, there's a the designer. Where there's engineering, there's an engineer. And sadly, many of these scientists just don't accept the witness of their own eyes that the world was designed, that the worlds were created. There's an abundant evidence of design. And most of the evidence that we find of design comes from within the biological world. Well, more than any other design feature found in the cosmos, the ability of animals to fly has caused us to marvel at them. From the smallest insect to the largest soaring bird, the ability of animals to fly has been a source of great awe and envy to us. They move with such grace and elegance and traverse great distances with ease. A bird can effortlessly glide or catch a thermal and ride it skyward. But travel for us, for humans, has always been very laborious, especially over rough te terrain or with elevation gain. But we can watch a bird soar and catch a thermal, and before you know it, you know it's already hitting that pass, and you're like, oh, you know, if you were walking it, how long it would take you to get up and over a pass. For humans, that has always been the case. <sighs> Well, insect flight has been a, a great mystery for a long period of time. Uh, insects are known, it was discovered at some point that insects were able to gain lift because they're creating little mini vortexes, little mini tornadoes on the leading edges of their wings. Tremendous design feature. But even though this was discovered, there are some insects that still kind of defy in engineering or defy laws of physics. And the, the this classic bee, the, especially the bumblebee, was one of these that an uh, early entomologist says should not be able to fly. This is an enormous bee, and for its size, it, it uses an incredibly fast wing beat. We're talking wing beats close to uh, approximating 230 beats per second. It wings flap at 230 beat times per second. Now, if, uh, you might have observations that it, this is a uh, mini insects wings beat similarly fast, but the bee is very large for other, other smaller insects do. If you've ever heard a mosquito get close to your ear, that high speed whine that you're hearing is 200 plus wing beats per second. That's what you're hearing. Well, uh, they, the, a lot of effort went into uh, analyzing the, uh, the, 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 the how a bee is able to fly. And uh, the researchers at Caltech use a combination of high speed digital photography. Uh, they were snapping freeze frame images of bees and they created a giant mock-up of a, a bee wing. And, and they say that bees use an unconventional com combination of short choppy wing strokes and a rapid rotation of the wing as it flops over and reverses direction in flight. Uh, mechanisms that the uh, researchers say um, has solved the mystery of bee flight. Maybe an engineer would um, tell, explain how flipping, flopping over of the wings solves this a tremendous mystery, but they say these animals are exploiting some of the most exotic flight mechanisms that are available to insects. Extraordinary uh, what, what these animals are able to do. And we've always marveled at their ability, and as long as we've been able to, we have tried, to, we have envisioned being able, hoping the ability to do such a thing. Leonardo da Vinci, for example, which, who you may know more of his art, uh, you may know Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa. He also painted the famous uh, uh, Lord's Supper painting with all the disciples facing in the same direction. Well, he was a scientist as well as an artist. And for a 15 year period of his life, he did an intensive study on the flight of birds and ultimately published this in 1505 in, in a book called the Codex on the Flight of Birds in, in which he said a bird is an instrument operating by pandemical laws, an instrument that is in the capacity of man to be able to make with all of its motions. And so he sought out to try to design a bird. 
and he created what he called uh, the orthoptera or the great bird. This is one of his drawings of his great bird design. A person would lay down on this mechanism and using their feet to flap the wings, uh, he hoped that men would be able to fly, such as the bird. Here's a, a look at what the wings that he, des he uh, had, the, had his design for the wings, which fleshed out would look like this. But at the time, all they had was wood and canvas, very heavy materials, and people don't have really the stamina in their legs to be able to continuously dr drive a machine like this. You know, you could get 30 feet in the air and then suddenly get a leg cramp and come crashing back down. But interesting, engineers took his designs and using, using modern lightweight materials and a motor were able to get the thing to fly. So it was a good design, but uh, it, this has been a longstanding practice of engineers to look at God's creations and either uh, try and use them to, for design ideas or to improve our own design ideas. And this is a practice called biomimicry, mimicking biology. And it's been a longstanding practice. Many inventions, many improvements in our own technologies have uh, come from studying God's creation. Velcro was designed after studying how stickers would stick to a uh, dog's hair. If you saw my dogs, good grief, I'm telling you, I would take those dogs out for a walk. And if we went through some uh, high, you know, weedy field, I could come back and have stickers just all up and down the side of that dog. And those things do not come out. You have to get scissors and cut those things out. When they looked at those, they realized each of those, each of the spines on those, those burrs or stickers had a hook on it and has thus led to the invention of the Velcro. They've intensely studied termite mounds. Why, why have you ever thought about why in the world do termites build these big structures above ground like this? Kind of odd, all the effort that goes into building these enormous termite mounds. I mean, some of them are really, really big. But when they probed into them, they realized these things are very cool. In, a, in, the, in the hot regions of where they tend to find them, the internal temperature of them is very cool. And so they studied what, what the architecture of these termite mounds and have used this to design buildings. There's a building in Zimbabwe, for example, called the Eastgate Center that was built specifically after studies that were made of the termite mound. We've studied shark skin. Uh, sharks are able to seem to uh, pump their tail once and seem to be able to just continuously glide through the water as if they have zero friction. And when they studied their skin uh, intensely, they, there was an unusual design feature found in their skin that we've now used to design professional swimwear. We've uh, studied gecko feet. Geckos are one of these reptiles that can not only just crawl up walls, but they can crawl across ceilings. And they do so. You have people uh, that have gone to hotels or lived in cabanas in areas where these things live, uh, wake up in the morning and find them up on the ceiling above their bed, these kind of things. Well, they studied their feet and found these pads of microscopic hairs on their toes of their feet, which give them, which in, in, uh, it tremendously enhances the electrostatic forces, lot, such as when you take a balloon and rub it on your head and it'll stick to a wall, electrostatic forces. Well, those uh, microscopic hairs on the pads of their feet greatly and increase the surface area that are, is available for electrostatic forces. And so those are able to stick to the wall and just walk across ceilings. And we've studied those and are now using those to make adhesive substances that instead of using glues, which can be, which can be toxic or the production of them can lead to toxic byproducts, these microscopic hairs could solve some of, the, some of these issues. They studied humpback whale fins. He's big. They said humpback whale fins are notched. And they realized that animals that use a very slow force like this can gain a lot more force with the unusual notching that is in, in their fins. And so they're now using that to improve turbine blades. Uh, we've morphing airplane wings is, is now a, a re, a, a reaching a reality point where, um, I mean, bird wings are not rigid like the airplane wings that we make. There's, they are constantly in movement. More so than that, they can actually control individual feathers. Watch a slow motion video of a bird in flight or a bird coming to a landing and you can see individual feathers come up one at a time as it is able to control those. And anyway, morphing airplane wings. And of course, robotics has always drawn from studies of either insects or, or mammals to try to design the, these uh, machines. Well, again, this is called biomimicry. But uh, despite this long-standing practice of searching for designs in biology, secular scientists uh, still refuse to acknowledge what this practice affirms. Listen to this definition of biomimicry from a science at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Biomimicry is the process of understanding the designs and materials we find in biology and adapting them for human use. 
So over the millions and millions of years of evolution, there's tremendous wisdom and efficiency in biological systems. Listen to what he says. <clears throat> Notice that he refers to designs found in biology and refers to the tremendous wisdom behind it all. See, naturalists, these natural scientists, scientists that hold to rigid philosophical naturalism, they, they see evidence of design, but they impart to nature the wisdom of God. Animals are so spectacularly well designed that they cry out, I am created. But animals refuse to acknowledge, again, the witness of their own eyes. Paul describes well what is happening today in the scientific community. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. He made the world in such a way that it testifies that it was made. But then he continues, for even though they knew God, they knew there was a creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is definitely what is happening in biology today, or in science today. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Well, lobsters have an amazing ability to see in extremely dark waters that prompted some intensive studies. They can see in waters that simply nothing should be able to see in. It was, uh, it was found that they have a compound eye with, that are very different from insects, that they give them the ability to intensify incoming light. Unlike the more common compound eyes of insects, which have hexagonal facets and bend or refract light onto the retina, this unique eye design incorporates square facets that you can see on the image on the left. That's a scanning electron micrograph. These uh, square facets are arranged radially, forming an optic array with a 180 degree field of view. The individual facets are basically tiny square tubes with reflective or mirrored walls that bounce the, uh, the, the image onto the same point in the retina, a technology called reflective superpositioning. And de well, developing technologies like this has caught the, caught the eye of a number of engineers. For example, in 2006, UK researchers at the University of Leicester announced that they were developing an X-ray telescope called the Lobster all sky x-ray monitor. We, they, we use these animals. The lobster eye was copied by the Physics Dep Optics Corporation operating under uh, funding by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to develop this device called the Lexid Lobster Eye X-ray Inspection Device. This, is, this handheld device would emit low-level radiation that would then bounce back and be collected and intensified by the lobster eye optic device and allow them to see through containers or behind concrete walls and even as uh, they see a potential use in archaeology, maybe to find the next, uh, next hidden tomb in the Valley of the Tombs or whatnot. Well, the mechanisms used for bird migration has puzzled scientists for years. We have found that birds navigate by various means. They, they, we know that they navigate by the sun. We know they navigate by the stars. Uh, experiments in planetariums have shown that they use uh, stars to navigate. And uh, they also use geographic landmarks. But all of these appear to be learned by experience. And yet many birds migrate vast distances from birth without guides to show them the way. And so what is the source of this innate migration capability. Let me give you a couple examples. The bristled thigh curlew flies unguided and nonstop 5,000 miles from Alaska to tropical Pacific islands every single year. The short-tailed shearwater migrates unguided again 8,000 miles from Australia to Alaska. And these are unguided. Now a lot of birds fly in big flocks with you know a senior bird out front showing them the way, but in both of these cases and others they, the parents leave before the chicks fledge. They usually go to very inhospitable areas to lay their eggs where there's few predators, in the area in the hospital, so there's few predators and they have to fly back to feeding grounds eventually. The parents leave before the chicks fledge and the chicks fly all of that way unguided. What makes this interesting is if we, when we realize that these migratory routes are learned, they have been learned since the flood, that these animals have migrated from where they were released in air at Species have, lots of species have developed since the flood. These species migrated around the world to these various areas where they now live. They've learned migratory routes based on seasonal requirements or predator prey you know, requirements. And that, those learned migratory routes are now passed onto their offspring as innate knowledge, somehow. 
It would be like your parents getting real good at calculus and you being born how to do calculus. Wouldn't that be amazing, right? I mean, literally. <laughs> monarch butterflies also have innate migration capability. All of the monarchs all the, from all over North America migrate down to Mexico every year. We're talking all the way as far away as Nova Scotia, 3,100 miles. Some of these monarchs migrate, 3,100 miles. And if you ever seen a butterfly fly, I mean, it's not really the you know, rapid kind of flight you would expect to be able to accomplish a 3,100 mile migration. But again, they got migrate unguided, completely unguided. And in fact, uh, it, it wasn't their, their parents have never gone before or even their grandparents. It was like their great grandparents was the last population to go because the normal monarch life cycle is very short. They lay eggs in milkweed, which is the plant on the left. They lay eggs in milkweed. The eggs hatch, and caterpillars just eat and eat, eat all day long. That's what caterpillars are. They're eating machines. They eat and eat and eat. As soon as the caterpillar gets big enough, it forms, a, forms a, 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 the cocoon or the chrysalis and uh, then undergoes metamorphosis, hatches out, right, of mates. The butterflies mate, die shortly thereafter, and lay eggs and die shortly thereafter. Caterpillar munches again, one more mating, usually like three generations during the summer. And then the generation that hatches close to winter has a longer life cycle. It's known as the Methuselah generation. Instead of only being a few weeks long, it's several months long, making the trip all the way down to Mexico, forming these enormous breeding colonies and all the way back. That'd be something to see, huh? Yeah, right? And they only recently discovered where they were going. The locals knew where they were going, but didn't catch out from modern science. Well, again, these are learned migratory routes that are somehow passed on to them as innate knowledge. Remember that butterf these butterflies were released somewhere in the mountains of Ararat, migrated around to these various areas, learned these migratory routes, and are somehow passing these on. Well, it's really not a mystery. God told us who made these. He says, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread his wings towards the south? No. God created these things with some amazing abilities. Well, the ability of animals uh, to, to migrate, again, precisely has puzzled scientists for years. Migrate, migration requires the ability to both navigate, which is change direction, and, and uh, know their direction of orientation. And again, uh, Migratory animals can do both of these. As mentioned before, birds, we know birds, uh, animals use multiple uh, uh, indicators for orientation. The sun, stars, geographical landmarks have been used. Uh, <clears throat> Several organisms have been shown to, uh, to use these kinds of abilities, but uh, including honeybees and uh, uh, even turtles we know are, are migratory in this way. But a new mechanism has recently been discovered that in the homing pigeon. So homing pigeons or carrier pigeons have been used to carry messages all the way back since the time of the ancient Egyptians. You can set up a coop someplace, let a colony develop inside your coop. You can transport them to another area and they will migrate back to where they were living very, very precisely. And uh, I mean, it, it, they can travel up to like 500 miles per day. And so, and so we've been using these to carry messages literally all the way back since uh, at the time of the ancient Egyptians and they were used in both world wars. True story, uh, in fact, there were, were 250,000 pigeons used by UK forces in World War II, and true story, 32 were awarded the Medal of Valor. <laughs> 32 pigeons were awarded the Medal of Valor for their service in the UK forces. Well, recently, researchers with homing pigeons done by the University of Frankfurt and, uh, have shown the pigeons, or pigeons are able to use the Earth's magnetic field to migrate because they have a sophisticated device called a magnetometer embedded in the neurons, the nerve cells in their beak. And it's not just a normal little magnet, it's a three axis magnetometer. The lead researcher, Gerda Fleischner, describes the discovery. She says, iron containing particles of magnemite and magnetite in the dendrites, uh, the sensory nerve cells are arranged in a complex three dimensional pattern with different spatial orientation designed to analyze the three components of the magnetic field vector separately, thus acting as a three axis magnetometer. I mean, God has just designed some extraordinary things within animals. Well, one of the features that makes our world so beautiful and so pleasing is the tremendous colors that abound. God made the world full of color because he, again, loves us and wanted to make a world that is pleasing to us and perhaps also to reveal to us a part of his divine nature that is otherwise not visible to us now. You know, I believe heaven will be a very colorful place. The throne of God and his glory will be a very, 
beautiful and colorful thing as well. Well, colors in the creation are made by modifying the wavelengths of photons. So the light particles are these things called photons and they move through the air in a wave. And so the, if you know the color spectrum, the visible color spectrum, the red end of the spectrum has the longest wavelength and the blue end of the spectrum has the shortest wavelength. So these photons have different dis waves, different lengths of waves and they thus they appear in the diff the different colors to us. Well, most colors that we see in s when we're looking at surfaces are due to the fact that the pigments in those surfaces absorb certain wavelengths of light and reflect others back. So plants, for example, absorb certain colors and they reflect back the green, which is why they look green to us. Flowers would be reflecting back the color of those flowers to us. But some colors are not produced by pigments. Now this is the same butterfly, top, and this is the top side of his wing and the bottom side of his wing. This is the blue morpho. Then the, the, bottom, the, the underside of his wing with the, with the false eyes, those little kind of peacock looking false eyes, the browns that you see there and the blacks are made by the ubiquitous pigment melanin that gives us our various shades of brown as well. Remember you guys learned about melanin this morning, remember? Well that butterfly also is brown because it has melanin. Well, the blue on the top of the wing is not produced by a pigment. It's instead produced by iridescence, which is the property of certain surfaces like the soap bubbles you see here, which, uh, which causes them to appear to change color as the angle of view changes. The, the in, in soap bubbles, the phenomena is caused by multiple reflective surfaces, uh, uh, with, so it has multi-layered surfaces allowing you to see multiple colors. But the blue morpho, it doesn't have multiple colors. It's a very uniform shade of blue. Now, if you tilt them a little bit, you can see, see a little purple, this kind of stuff, but a very uniform shade of blue is produced, but no pigment. And so how does this, how was this accomplished? Well, researchers looked into this and in 2001, a detailed analysis of the wing found that, uh, found, uh, found the, the unique design feature that was found within their scales. Now all butterfly wings are scaled. All butterflies and moths have scaled, co scale covered wings. That's what their name means, Lepidoptera. All of your wing names in an optera, which means wing. And so the first part of the word, Hymenoptera, Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, describes the kind of wing that they have. Even beetles all have wings. You, know, they, you often don't see them because they're under a shell, but they'll pop that shell up, out comes the wings, and they go flying off. Well, these are the a normal butterfly wings shown here with the scanning electron micrograph. I'll blow those up further in 200 power, further into 1,000 power. That's a single scale now. And then I'll show it at a 5,000 power to show the engineering structures that make up the normal butterfly wing. They're made up of these long beams that you see here, or supported by regular joists or connections between, along their length. However, upon close examination, it was discovered that the blue morpho butterfly wings are structurally different from normal scales and serve as bio, what they call biophotonic crystals. Instead of the beams being connected together by joist, this is a cross section. So the beams are running uh, long ways. So, but instead of those beams being connected together by those joists, they, instead it looked like it, they were broken and, and had this Chris, weird Christmas tree structure. Uh, along, their, along the length, repeated ridges, you know, if you will, branches. And these ridges or these branches have reflective surfaces that reflect light back repeatedly. Each branch reflects light back at, at each successive layer, producing an intensifying effect within the, what is a tetrahedral or diamond-like structure arrangement of these scales. So complex biophotonic crystals that they have. These multiple reflective layers allow the blue morpho design to intensify the color through what's called constructive interference, wherein the light waves merge and complement each other and strengthen the reflection. The effects of, uh, of iridescent create a much more intense color than ordinary pigments ever could. It's been, uh, pilots have reported seeing blues emanating from rainforest canopies when the blue morphos were, uh, con had congregated in numbers. Well, a number of engineering concepts have arisen in recent years following the discovery of this design, uh, the Ted, uh, um, including uh, Tengen Fibers Limited has made the first uh, world's first fibers called Morphotext uh, uh, that uh, instead of being made by, with the colors being made by pigments, involve iridescence, controlled iridescence due to the, you know, the carefully architectured reflective surfaces. Qualcomm developed a, a display device 
based on the blue morpho design. You can see the butterfly wing again used uh, both in their pamphlet. You see the uh, up there, the blue morpho in their pamphlet and the butterfly shown in their logo of their Mirasol display, acknowledging where these design features have come from. Well, cephalopods are also masters of color, masters of color changing. Um, one of the ways that your cephalopods communicate amongst others, amongst, amongst touchy-feely kind of stuff as well, is through color changing. They flashing colors at each other, while flashing on one side and then not on the other side. And during mating and stuff, you see a lot of color, a lot of visual communication being used. But they also use it for camouflage very well. Watch this octopus camouflage itself by changing into seaweed in uh, just an instant there. <laughs> So they can do this by changing both the texture of their skin and their color. Now, many animals can change their color. I mean, chameleons are masters of this too. There's some really cool videos online of chameleons changing their color, and it's just amazing. Seems to emanate from their feet. If they step on something, it seems to ripple up their leg, and they change into whatever color is, is exposed to them in this way. Well, uh, animals have multiple technologies available to them to change color, but the cephalopods have all of them. They have all the color mechanisms that are available to multiple different animals. They, they have the chromatophores, which you see, that, which is what is shown in the video on the right. Chromatophores are cells with pigments that have these elastic, sa in elastic sacs that can be stretched out by muscles or brought together. So you stretch them out if you want to look red, if there's a red pigment in that sac, or you just cluster that pigment together if you don't want to be red anymore. They have chromatophores. They also have what are called iridophores. These are tiny stacks of plates that produce the ir iridescent color like the blue morpho. They also have leucophores, plates that reflect back the surrounding light, so they can, they can uh, um, match the surrounding light intensity, giving them some ability to camouflage there. And they also have bioluminescent structures, like the ninja lantern shark I showed you recently. They can make light. Cuttlefish have all of these, or cephalopods have all of these. Um, and and as in doing so, they can blend into almost any surface. They can make themselves into, into to looking like almost anything. Well, this is a, a technology. It's called active camouflage. Lots of animals can camouflage. I mean, zebras camouflage by just all being striped. You would think, why the hell is it in the world of black and white stripes so can't give them camouflage ability? Well, by being in a big herd, you can't pick out one of them. So by being all together in a herd, that black and white striping helps, helps them blend together, you know? But uh, the, it's active camouflage has, has something we would very much like to do. You know, we love our military to be able to blend into changing sur uh, our surroundings. And so we've looked into active camouflaging, but, uh, and this is, this image that you show here is from uh, some 2003 work that was done by, uh, by uh, the University of Tokyo to create a prototype camouflaging system they call retroreflective projection technology. But all they're really doing is projecting uh, the image that's behind the cloak onto it. So you can get in, but nothing at all. They can't, we can't have no way of doing what God is able to create at this point in terms of active camouflage. Now, as a way, to, uh, just I want to show you something else pretty cool. So one of the cephalopods called the cuttlefish. So you got squids and octopus. The cuttlefish are the absolute masters of this color changing capability. And not only can, do they use this for camouflage, but they can do something else very interesting with this. And this reminds me of, uh, there's, this, there's a, a, a snake in the Jungle Book. Remember the old Jungle Book cartoon? We had the LP, so I still know all the Jungle Book songs. I would belt out, you know, uh, King Louis. Yeah, I'm a king of the swingers. Oh, yeah, I could, uh, I could do them all, okay? <laughs> but there's a snake that hypnotizes Mowgli, okay? Watch this. Kind of reminds me. Who knows? I guarantee the producers of Jungle Book didn't know that there's an animal that actually does something like this. This is a cuttlefish trying to sneak up on a crab, and he'll do so by trying to make himself look like the coral. Throws up his tentacles, you know, to try to blend in some coral. But the reason why it doesn't fill this for crab is that coral doesn't swim, you know? So it's kind of, and he's like, good dude, coral doesn't swim. You're like swimming at me. I know you're not a piece of coral. But if, the, if a blending into the coral doesn't help, then he has another trick that he can pull out. Watch what he does here. I'll give you another look at it here. But he, he does, a, puts on a light show to try to mesmerize this crab. And it does so in a way that's very effective. The crab will just be stunned by this little light show that he puts on, and then he can come in and nab it. It looks like a little spaceship, I mean, right? Look at that. Isn't that wild? 
puts on a little light show for this crab. The crab will then go, oh, what is that? That is snack. And you got your lunch, you know? Well, one thing, when we, as we see all of this amazing design we find in animals, it should not be surprising to us, especially when we consider that the animals are the only part of God's creation that he spent two days on. Spent two days on animals. On the day five, he, he made the flying creatures and sea creatures. The same length of time he made, spent making the entire rest of the cosmos. Made the sun and moon and stars. So all of those galaxies, the entire, all the astronomical bodies were made on one day of the creation. The same length of time he spent making just the flying creatures and the sea creatures. So we should not be surprised that all of the, of the designs that we find in the flying animals and the sea creatures, you know, tremendous design is found in there. He wanted to make a world for us that was something very, very special. But remember, he made it just for us, just for us. Remember Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. But we can learn a lot about God's qualities by observing what He has made. God made the world full of wonders because He is wonderful. He made beautiful things because He is beautiful. He made things that are tremendously complex and mysterious because He is beyond our understanding. He made things we marvel at because He's marvelous, things of enormous power because he is powerful. Truly, his eternal power and divine nature are on display within the creation to reveal himself to us. And we should say, glory to God, hallelujah, that our God went to such trouble to make this wonderful world for us. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this wonderful world. And we thank you so much for the animals, animals that bring such joy into our lives. I have loved my animals so much. Thank you for Willie and Eli and Chelsea, I love them so much. Thank you, Lord, for the time that I spent with them. Thank you for our animals. We do love them so much. And we praise you and glorify you for giving them to us, for that tremendous gift. Thank you for this wonderful world, Lord. You are glorious and you are wonderful. And Father God, we can't wait to see the kingdom of heaven that you have prepared for us as well. If this world is any indication, Father God, we know that your home that you prepared for us there is going to be something else. Lord, we praise you, Father. We ask again for you to fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and teach us, Father. We need to learn, and we need you to teach us, Father God. Give us wisdom and insight about this world. Give us wisdom and insight about the science that's being taught today, the science that tries to claim that you do not exist and that this world came about through natural processes alone. Father God, we know that's not true. But help us, Lord. Teach us through your Holy Spirit about the science. Help us to learn this science so that we can be a better witness for you, Father God. And, and give us boldness to speak, Lord. Let us not wait for them to learn these things somewhere else. Help us to help speak to them. Give us boldness to speak to those that are around us. Speak about your creation. Speak about, your, about the truth that we know from your word. Let us help us to speak about your son, Yeshua, who was, came and died for us and paid the penalties for our sins. Help us speak about what sin is and how much you hate sin. Help us, Lord. Examine us. Father God, help us to identify the sin that's in our own life, Father God, and help us to purge that from our life. Let your power be made perfect in our weakness. Convict us of sin in our life. Help us to walk the path of righteousness, Lord God, we ask. And help us to be about the work of the kingdom by spreading the news of your glory and the death of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.